So uh, last week, uh, Gina had the opportunity to preach, and uh, she started this uh, this little this two part message on the three chairs, and that's where we're picking up today, as as we as we kind of uh, look at the next two chairs. We we kind of crossed over, and we'll, we'll do a little review. Don't worry, if you weren't here last week, we'll get you up to speed, okay? Uh, this, uh, this message was uh, first, we first heard it, uh, actually, uh, before we ever heard it from Bruce Wilkerson, we heard it from Gina's dad. Um, and he, he preached a message on the three, choices uh, three the choices of three generations. And I remember the message, and I, it always stuck with me. Then we, then we came across uh, the, the book by Bruce Wilkinson uh, on uh, experiencing spiritual breakthroughs, the, the, the three chairs. And uh, it, it, has, it, it has impacted our lives. And we wanted to share this with you today. Uh, and, and some of our, our resourcing as we prepared this message was from Gina's Dad's sermon that we were able to that we were able to find, and then uh, also from a little bit of Bruce what Bruce Wilkin has written, uh, and then thoughts that the that the Holy Spirit has dropped in our hearts to give to you. So that's what that's where that's where this message that's the genesis, if you will, of this message. So today we're going to look at three lives in one family, three lives in one family in the Old Testament, and we're going to use the illustration of the three chairs to show an important pattern. And you, this, this shows up at least three times, at least three times in the Old Testament, okay? But just, just to get you up to speed, chair number one is the chair of commitment or the chair of conviction. Chair number two is the chair of compromise. And chair number three is the chair of conflict. So let's review from last week. We're looking at the life of King David. And we saw um, from the life of King David, he sat in this first chair, in this chair of commitment and with commitment comes strong conviction. And chair one describes a relationship with God that is God and me. God has the priority. It's God and me working together. It's a close, personal relationship with God. And like I said, this is the chair that David sat in. And he was anointed to become the next king of Israel. And he was empowered by the Holy Spirit. And God, because God knew David's heart was dedicated to him. So last Sunday, Gina summed up the characteristics of a first chair uh, believer, first chair person this way. Now, now look, she had like, like a dozen <laughs> characteristics. I'm going to condense them down to three. You're welcome, okay? <laughs> so here they are. Yeah, remember, she had, she had like 11 pages of notes, <laughs> all right? Uh, she's got like nine today, all right? So... <laughs> So we got to stay on track, right? So, so I'm condensing these, okay, because we went through them last week, but here they are. Here's the first one. The first characteristic of a first chair person is they love God passionately. They love God. The second characteristic is they're committed to seeking God's kingdom first. In other words, that just as Jesus taught, seek first the kingdom of God, right, and his righteousness, Right? You remember that? Matthew 6. Okay. All right. Some of you need to go back there. All right? This is the priority. There's a kingdom priority in the first chair. And listen, people that know you know your priorities. They know what's most important to you. The, the next characteristic that we talked about is that first chair Christians have had a powerful personal encounter with God, and they've experienced God. They've, they've seen his hand at work, his ongoing work in their lives, and here's the last thought, they put themselves in a position to continue to experience God, but not just themselves, they put their families in a position to experience God. And what's important to know about these three chairs is the chair that you sit in affects your decisions. And also the chair you sit in determines the choices that, you're, that you make. And we see this commitment to God's will, his way, and his timing lived out in David's decisions. Well, until his decisions didn't consider God and David did this slide over to the second chair, the chair of compromise. This is when we get comfortable. It's easy for us to make this slide from the chair of commitment. I'm sold out to God. 
Lord, everything is to all of a sudden we find ourselves, all of a sudden, not really all of a sudden, but we find ourselves sitting over here in chair number two in compromise. So it's, it's a subtle shift. It's not always a dramatic, it can be a dramatic shift from for where, where we have been in our faith or we compromise our faith and move into that second chair. It can be dramatic and sudden, but oftentimes, and this is the, this is the concerning part, we'll get to this, it's, it is a subtle slide. David wasn't where he should have been. Right. That's the bottom line. Instead of leading his army into war, he was enjoying afternoon naps. That's <laughs> what the Bible says. Yep. And after one of those restful respites, David's restless heart is revealed. That's a lot of R's, by the way. Okay? After <laughs> his restful respite, respite, his restless heart is revealed. Yep. And the consequences that followed, that simple compromise of not being where he should be, were horrific. Think about it. Adultery, cover-up, murder, and the death of a child. And I said this last week, but how many times do we compromise where we should be for where we shouldn't be? Something to think about. All in, all, as in David's example, there can be immediate repercussions and future consequences Consequences that come from misplaced priorities or sinful decisions. And this is especially, especially important for, for, us that are, for us parents. If we drift from chair one to chair two, it doesn't affect just you. A lot of people say, well, it's just about me. Well, this just affects me. No, it doesn't. It affects your family. It affects everyone that follows you. And it especially affects your children. Your children are watching and they're listening to you. Your life, Gina said last week, your life is your testimony. Okay, if you're not a parent, all right, then this still applies. Right. Because people are watching your life. Yeah. And if you compromise, it will affect others. If, if you let me put it this way, if your words and your actions don't align, there's a descriptive word for that, right? When our words and our actions don't align. And those who follow our lives are conflicted over our hypocrisy. Even though David repented of his sin. Get this. He moved back into the first chair. We read this in Psalm 51. Gina, Gina alluded to that last week. In it, and you, you can't read Psalm 51 without getting a sense of the emotion that his heart is broken as, as the prophet Nathan confronts him in his sin and, and the cover-up, the attempted cover-up of his sin. And, and his response in Psalm 51 is absolute repentance, asking God to forgive, to restore the joy of his salvation. And, and we know that David moved from the second chair back into the first chair. But listen, his decision still affected others. Yes. Yes. The consequence of his decision is even borne out in his relationship with his son Solomon. But the Bible tells us that early on, King Solomon, this is what it says, King Solomon loved the Lord and followed all the decrees of his father. 1 Kings 3, 3, that's what it says. King Solomon loved the Lord and followed all the decrees of his father. He sought the Lord, we know, for wisdom, right? And God blessed him in wonderful ways. So if you want to open your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 3, I'll give you a minute to get there. We're going to start at verse 9, and we're going to look at Solomon's prayer uh, to the Lord and then God's response to Solomon's prayer. So 1 Kings chapter 3, starting with verse 9, Solomon says to the Lord, Give me an understanding heart so that I can govern your people well. And know the difference between right and wrong. For who by himself is able to govern this great people of yours? And notice the, the, what he says there, that's all a total dependence on God. Saying, God, I can't do this by myself. That's, that's chair one faith. That is. That's chair one faith. Saying, God, I need you to help me to govern, to rule over your people. To know the difference between right and wrong. So... 
then he and so the Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for wisdom. So God, re God replied, because you have asked for wisdom in governing my people with justice and have not asked for a long life or wealth or the death of your enemies, I will give you what you asked for. I will give you a wise and understanding heart such as no one else has had or ever will have. And I will also give you what you did not ask for, riches and fame. No other kingdom, king in all the world will be compared to, to you for the rest of your life. And if you follow me and obeyed my decrees and de de uh, de de commands, sorry, as your father David did, I will give you wait, a wait, long wait, wait, wait. life. As, your, as, as his father David did, and is that in there? if you follow me and obey my decrees and my commands as your father David did. Notice that this is after David's sin. God still recognizes David, right? Are you guys get how important this is for you and me? How many of you have sinned? <laughs> Every hand. Come on. Every if, hand. If, if someone's near you and their hand didn't go up, you need to help them, okay? Trust me, okay? They just sinned. Okay, they lied, all right? All right, but we're in church before God and everybody here. We've all sinned, okay? Yeah, some of you need to put up two hands, okay? I'm just saying, right? I'm with you, okay? So here, everybody here has sinned, and yet... And yet we know this, if we confess our sins, right, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, God is what? Faithful, Faithful and just. just to do what? Forgive. Forgive our, and to do what? And to cleanse us from all wickedness. Right. And that's what God did in David's heart. David, who compromised horribly, adultery, cover-up, murder, Right? And what did God do when he asked for forgiveness? God forgave. And David was restored to first chair. That's important for you and me. Yes. For us sinners. <laughs> right? <That's> right. <laughs> We're all together, right, in this? Right. So look, here's what we know about Solomon. Although Solomon began his reign with a strong commitment to the Lord, we know the rest of the story. Yeah? We know that unlike his father, Solomon left the first chair into the second chair, and he never returned back to the first chair, which is why his life represents the second chair. But how did his slide begin? See, when the Israelites entered the promised land, you know how God knows everything, he knew that they would eventually want to have a king to rule over them just like the other nations around them. So he gave them guidelines. He gave guidelines for the king, which is found in Deuteronomy 17, verses 16 and 17. So this is, oh wait, can you stay at slower? I'm trying to get there. Deuteronomy. 17, what? Word. Deuteronomy. Okay. We can break it up. Right, I'm there now. Okay. Listen, listen to this. You're about to enter the land the Lord your God is giving you. All right, remember, this is, this, is, this is at the end of the exile, all right, He's, or at the end of their captivity in Egypt, rather. He says, you are about to enter the land the Lord your God is giving you. When you take it over and settle there, you may think, we should select a king to rule over us like the other nations around us. If this happens... Be sure to select as king the man the Lord your God chooses. You must appoint a fellow Israelite. He may not be a foreigner. The king must not build up a large stable of horses for himself or send his people to Egypt to buy horses. For the Lord has told you, you must never return to Egypt. The king must not take many wives for himself because they will turn his heart away from the Lord. And he must not accumulate large amounts of wealth in silver and gold for himself. Those last two words are really important. Solomon not only had the commands from the law, okay, he also had David's last charge in 1 Kings chapter 2, uh, verses 2 through 4. Check this out. 
It says, I am going where, David is, pr is praying, and he's talking to Solomon, and he says, I'm going where everyone on earth must someday go. So he says, take courage and be a man. Observe the requirements of the Lord your God and follow all his ways. Okay, that, that would be the law that we just read, right. okay, from Deuteronomy. And the next part, keep the decrees, the commands, the regulations, and laws written in the law of Moses. So that, that's what we just read in Deuteronomy. Yes. Did I is. repeat myself? You interrupted me, but that's okay. Okay. <laughs> I've been known to do that. Uh, just a little bit. Mo uh, <laughs> so, and the reason why you're to obey these decrees and laws is so that you will be successful in all that you do and wherever you go. And then David continues. He says, if you do this, then the Lord will keep the promise he made to me. David's talking about himself. He told me, if your descendants live as they should, and follow me faithfully with all their heart and soul, one of them will always sit on the throne of Israel. Follow me faithfully with all their heart and soul. Does that sound like first chair? Yeah. Absolutely. Solomon fulfilled his father's dream. We know this. Yeah. At least initially, one of his father's dreams was to build the temple, right? To honor God. God said, no, David, you can't build it. Your hands are, your hands are covered in blood. You're, you're, you're a warrior. I'm going to allow your son to build the temple. So Solomon did that. He built a magnificent temple for God. And it took him how many years? S seven years to build the temple. It took him 13 years to build the palace. All right, before we do the math here... And when he was to build that temple for God, David provided a lot of what he needed to build that temple. He, David was working to make sure he had the supplies, the resources, whatever it was to build the temple. So you look at that. Seven years to build a temple. Thirteen years to build your own palace. And he had, I think this shows Solomon's heart is that he had a desire to, his bigger investment was going to be in building this fancy palace for him and his family. And this reveals Solomon's heart. So the same thing would apply to you and me. Where we invest our resources mm -hmm. reveals our heart. Yeah. Is that right? Yes. Of course it's right because Jesus said it. <laughs> Matthew six twenty one. wherever your treasure is, there, the desires of your heart will also be. So what happened with Solomon is with great success and wealth, a slide began to take place from the first chair of commitment to the chair of compromise. The Bible tells us that Solomon accumulated, oh, let me see, this sounds like everything that God said not to do. Let me see, he accumulated great wealth. Um, he had a lot of horses and chariots. That he sent his people to Egypt to mm, get. Okay, so that's disobedience. All right, but... Well, wait, 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 hang on, hang on, hang on. Didn't God tell him, though, in that promise that we read, you know, when he prayed for wisdom, didn't God tell him that he was going to bless him? So what, what's the distinction? God said, I'll make you wealthy. I'll give you all the things you didn't ask for. Riches and fame. Riches and fame. So why does this now become a snare to him? Because his heart has shifted to the chair of compromise, and that's what we have to be careful of because then our heart turns on what our possessions are into the, instead of to the one who blessed us. So it's less Jesus. about God and more about me. Okay, remember this. But you know what led to his ultimate downfall? Was his many marriages. Listen to this. 1 Kings 11 Verse 3. I, I, this just blows my mind. He had 700 wives of royal birth. Oh, that's not all. I can't handle one. <laughs> I mean, I'm, what I mean is I can... I wish it said husband. I'm blessed, I I'm blessed by one. one. I'm blessed by one. You that's better. what I meant to say. And no concubines. I see the couch on the future. All right. <laughs> so 700 wa wives of royal birth, but that wasn't all. 300 concubines. And in fact, they did turn his heart away from 
almost exactly quoting from Deuteronomy. It's almost an exact quote. The king should not have many wives. And yet Solomon takes seven, and by the way, those of royal birth, those were all marriages that, that signified alliances with foreign kingdoms. So those 700 wives and 300 concubines, all right, over time, didn't marry them all at once, but over time they led his heart away from the Lord. Solomon's compromise began when he disobeyed the law with how he used his wealth, his power, and his prestige. His compromise was sealed with his many pagan wives. When when his heart turned away from God, as his heart turned away from God, Solomon slowly moves from the first chair to the second chair. You know what about this chair, this second chair of compromise? This chair is most concerning for Christians. If the first chair represents God and me, the second chair represents me and a little bit of God. We're making a shift to where God has lost his first place in our heart. So let, let's put hit God pa- on the back burner. Right. And, that, and, and that's why I think that we should just hit pause right here for a second. Let me talk to parents for just a second. The purpose of the Christian family is to raise children who love and serve the Lord. Right? That's right. That's That's the purpose. That's what it is. That's the purpose of the Christian family, to raise children who love and serve the Lord. There's an inextricable, that means that you can't separate it, link between your godly character and your determined or intentional discipleship of your children so that they grow into godly adults. This is our responsibility. And that's why we need to take a moment to examine our own heart, our own lives. And that examination can begin with a simple question. Do I have any area of compromise in my life? Is there any area of of compromise in my life. Now, let me just tell you something. If you ask God that question in prayer, expect an answer. But here's the truth. Listen to this. Most of us already know what our compromise is. We, We go to God kind of disingenuously, and we say, God, would you show me, hoping he doesn't know, hoping somehow that our fig leaves have covered our sin, right? But we're naked before God. He sees everything. And he knows. And that's why the prayer that David said, and I just love this prayer, I've said it many times, where David says, search my heart and see if there's any wicked way. See if there's not any wicked way as well as, this, Lord, is there any compromise yeah. in my life? See, we, we know this, guys. We live in a world of compromise. Where the, and how many times has pastor used the expression that the current of the world is what? Always, let's see if you know it, flowing Flowing away, away from God. Which is why the second chair represents a drift. It's a compromise. It's a movement away from God. And look, our our walk must confirm our words. If our walk contradicts our words, we damage or we lose our testimony. And so this is the parental calling. The Lord wants you to pass that baton of godliness to the next generation. I told you last week, this is where my heart, this, my passion is, is because I, I represent generations of believers. And I want to see that generation of believers continue to my children, to my grandchildren, until the Lord comes. I want to see it passed on. But it starts with me as a parent, and it will start with my children as they are parents. And if we choose to leave a godly legacy, your values will have to be revealed in your actions so that your children can see your commitment to Christ and not just hear about it. They have to see your commitment to Christ. It, then your influence on your kids will imprint them forever. 
My parents were not in ministry uh, as Gina's mom and dad were as pastors. My parents were involved in church, as, as Gina mentioned last week. And I'm just going to tell you, I had no doubt, I had no doubt that they were committed to God. As I grew up, I had no doubt that they were committed. I, I knew it. And, and, uh, and they, they I, I, yes, I was an abused child because they made me go to church. <laughs> It's terrible, folks. I mean, there were times that I didn't want to go to church, and I told them, I don't want to go to church. And my dad said, you're, you're heck out of luck, bud, because we're going to church. And if we have to tie you to the bumper, you're going with us. <laughs> I tell you, as I got older, as I became a teenager, you know, when you're, when you're yeah, as a teenager, when you're old enough to make all those decisions about your life because you're, you're mature, right? And I told my parents, I said, hey, I told my mom, I say, hey, I, I got to work, I got to work this Wednesday instead of going to, to, to youth group, I got to work this Wednesday. And my, my mom said, uh, no, you're not. I'm like, well, yeah, he put me on the schedule for Wednesday. And, and my mom said, okay, I'll call him for you. No, 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 don't call my, don't call my boss. I don't want you caught, because I know what she would have done. She would go, hello, Mr. Mesh. Hey, I just want to let you know that Jeffrey can't come tonight. And I would never live that down. So it was way better for me to go at, uh, to Mr. Mesh, my, my manager at the department store I worked at, and, and just say, hey, listen, I can't work. I can't work Wednesday, because, and if you don't let me off, my mom's calling you. <laughs> So, so listen, I knew about commitment. I understood commitment uh, from my, watching my parents' example. And listen, King Solomon began his reign diligently, first chair, seeking God for wisdom. But the Bible tells us that in his, listen to this, in his inaugural worship service as king, Solomon offered to God 1,000 burnt offerings. Says this in 1 Kings 3 4, 1,000 burnt offerings. And isn't this ironic? Solomon ended his reign with 1,000 wives leading his heart away from God. Solomon's slide to chair two occurred over time. And this is how it happens in our life one compromise at a time, one bad decision at a time. One bad choice at a time to where eventually we are no longer in this chair of commitment, loving God. He's first place in my life to now we're in chair number two. And now it's more about me. And, oh, yeah, God's, God's there, but, but I'm focused on me. Okay, so listen to it again. If the first chair represents God and me, the second chair represents a shift, me and God. God has lost first place in our heart. So let's just review some second chair characteristics here. Second chair believers, they know about faith. They know about faith. They can probably articulate what they believe, but it's not a vibrant faith to them. They may talk to their children about God in general terms, but they have no real firsthand experience to pass on because they have not experienced God themselves. My father-in-law wrote this in the description of those in the second chair. Listen to, the, the, listen to this. He says, the most unhappy, frustrated, stressed, and disillusioned people in the world aren't non-Christians. That's what we would expect, right? He says, the most stressed, the most depressed is second chair Christians who know about Christ but who fight him and his leadership over their lives for years and even decades. The second chair person works for, for money. Uh, for prestige, for power, for possessions, for pleasure. The compromisers go through the, the same motions as the committed. They look a lot like the same, same, but ultimately they don't trust and they don't obey the Lord. And they have no internal strength from conviction that's birthed out of commitment. And so they vacillate, they waffle between life between chair one and chair two what and what was conviction to the first generation becomes old out of touch just tradition 
to the second chair generation. If you sit in the second chair, you begin to see the Bible as outdated. And therefore, if the Bible's outdated, it's out of touch. That helps you to ignore <laughs> any scripture that's inconvenient to your current lifestyle. Yeah. And second chair people are deeply committed to themselves. Which explains why the second chair can be a chair of bondage. You're bondage to yourself. It's a place where self is on the throne of your heart. And God is maybe on the tip of your tongue. But it binds people into a selfish lifestyle. Second chair people don't have motivation to pray as their parents did. Uh, consequently, they don't experience God's power in the same way. They don't experience God's presence in a life-changing way. They don't hunger after an experience. They don't even hunger after an experience with God because, listen, you won't hunger after something you've never tasted. That's right. And a lot of times what happens in this second chair is these are, these are people that have grown up in a Christian home, and they lived under biblical standards of morality. But without a vibrant prayer life, they don't develop deep convictions and only half-heartedly attempt to observe God's guidelines for our life in how, in, and how we live. So they grew up, a second chair person grows up hearing about the old days of revival, but their reference will not be a powerful meeting with God. No personal experience. That's why their Christian lifestyle tends to be just going through the motions. And just on a side note, have you noticed, I know growing up we would have revival services at our church. They'd be all week. Wait, you mean like on Monday night? Yeah. Tuesday night? Tuesday. If we tried that now, you wouldn't come. <laughs> now, you just called them second chair Christians. Careful here. Let me hold Gina back here. <laughs> Okay. She just accused the whole room of being in second chair. Hold up. Hold up. Okay. All right. Most, no. <laughs> it would be discouraging to us to do it because to get people to come Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I'm busy. My kids have to do this or I've got to do that. I'm tired. I, I, you know what? I'm convinced that our parents, when they had those, those kind of revivals, they weren't busy. <laughs> I know they weren't. They, when they had those week, Josh, when they had those week-long revivals, seven days, that, that if the Holy Spirit were moving could roll into another week of revival, they weren't, my parents weren't busy at all. They weren't tired because my dad didn't really work back then. You know, he just got a paycheck, you know, for showing up at an office. I, I know he didn't. I, I, I just, listen, listen, we talk about, I, I don't know, we're being facetious, but, but listen very carefully to me, okay? And I'm not, we're not calling you out. That's not, our goal is not to make no. you feel guilt, well, maybe a little bit. <laughs> but not, 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 we don't want everybody dragging their way out of here. Uh, there's no hope. We're second chair <laughs> compromisers. And, and pastor, it, 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 they, there'll be no revival at Calvary. Wrong, wrong, <laughs> wrong. Okay. Because I, I believe that God can still do a work Absolutely. in our hearts and Absolutely. lives. All right. He doesn't. And, and, and in fact, what if he doesn't need seven days? Maybe with that generation, he needed seven days. Okay. <laughs> But how many days does he need with this generation? Are you listening? Okay. Look, we, I, it's easy to it's easy to kind of snipe and look, you know, and and but we're just telling you, folks, that, look, hear our hearts on this. Okay. We don't want anybody walking out of here just dragging their way. I'll ne there's no hope because that's not true. That's right. David is our David is is the guy. David slid into the second chair of compromise. Okay. Badly failed. Badly but repented and moved back into the first chair. Solomon never does that. Once he's in the second chair, he stays in the second chair. Yes. And the second generation, I think this is where, where it really gets me, is where the cause of Christ is either won or lost. And here's why. They will either decide to move back to the first chair and be committed, sold out to God. Or they will remain in the second chair and allow their faith just to wither away and possibly could even slide on over to the third chair. 
So one more caution for parents. Second chair people have got to be careful as parents and the influence that we talked about that parents have that their children aren't removing God from the throne of their heart. Got to know this, friends, that, that the influence that we have as, as, as parents, but all, again, if you're not a parent, you have influence. Yes. People are watching your life. Right. And your compromise can become their license. Your liberty... That's, that's the one I love to hear people say, well, I, ha- I can do anything. I, I have liberty in Christ. That's what Paul says in Romans. It's, it's, yeah, and you're right. Okay? But you need to read the rest of what he said, which is don't let your liberty, don't let your liberty become a stumbling block to someone else. Mm-hmm. Are you listening? Yeah. We've got to be careful. Okay? Your liberty will become their license, and they will effectively move God off the throne of their hearts. Just as David influenced his son Solomon, Solomon would influence his son, and Rehoboam represents the third chair, the chair of conflict. So Rehoboam is Solomon's son, and he becomes king, and he he began his reign here in this third chair. And at the beginning, he was faced with a difficult decision. The people of Israel approached Rehoboam, he's 41 years old, okay? He's, he, he's just beginning his reign over, over Israel. And the people approached him and asked Rehoboam, would you please lighten the harsh tax load that my father Solomon had put on them? By the way, another indication that Solomon remained right here. Because his riches weren't the, just the blessings from God. His riches were drawn from taxing, overtaxing the people, the people that he was called to serve, by the way. So the young king, when they, they came to him and they said, please, just lighten the load, the young king, Rehoboam, asked for three days to think about their request. So what Rehoboam did is he discussed it first with the older generation, those that served under his father Solomon and, and got their advice. And their advice was, they said, lighten the tax load. And if you'll do that, the people will always be loyal to you and and your subjects will be loyal to you is what they'll do if you will lighten the load that your father put on them. 1 Kings 12, 7 is where we're at, by the way. Rehoboam rejected the advice of the older men and instead he asked the advice of the younger men that he grew up with. And man, you need to hear... You need to hear what they did. This is 1 Kings chapter 12, okay? And you need to hear what they had to say. Listen to this. Picking up at verse 10. The young men replied, this is what you should tell those complainers who want a lighter burden. My little finger is thicker than my father's waist. Yes, my father laid heavy burdens on you, but I'm going to make them even heavier. My father beat you with whips, but I'll beat you with scorpions. How about that? And guess which advice he went with? His peers. And the people, so the people responded to Rehoboam's harshness by rebelling against the new king with 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel making Jeroboam their king. And only the tribes of Judah and Benjamin followed Rehoboam, son of Solomon. So in response, King Rehoboam gathers an army of 180,000 warriors, and he is determined to take back the ten tribes. But God prevents it. If you go on to read in chapter 12, it picks up at verse 24, and it says this, this is what the Lord says, do not fight against your relatives, the Israelites. Go back home, for what has happened is my doing. So they obeyed the message of the Lord and went home as the Lord commanded. Wait, they obeyed so that maybe he's not in the third chair. Maybe he's not in the third chair. Maybe he obeyed the word of the Lord. Maybe, maybe he's, he's in the second chair. Or maybe he's moved up to the first chair with that obedience, right? Look, the division, this division between the ten tribes under Jeroboam and the two tribes under Rehoboam, that division marked the end of a united Israel. 
And this is what it says. There was constant warfare between Rehoboam and Jeroboam. 1 Kings chapter 14. Oh, didn't God tell him not to make war? And yet there was constant war. That's what it says in chapter 14, verse 30. Constant war. And it went on for hundreds of years afterwards. You know, it's amazing, I think, if you really think about it. Rehoboam was in a position to be a good king. He was in a position to be a good king. But he didn't seek what was best for the people. He could have been a great king. A godly king. A, a godly king. But whether he was motivated by prideful arrogance or by, driven by insecurity, and, and boy, you need to get those two things. You need to understand how wicked those two things can be in terms of motivating us into bad decisions. Pride. Right. And insecurity. And insecurity. Yeah. What, what, whichever what was the motivating factor in Rehoboam's heart, this is what we know. He never consulted God. In fact, there's very little evidence of a relationship between Rehoboam and God because Rehoboam's heart wasn't devoted to the Lord, and as a result, the land was divided. So let's, let's review. So chair one, help me review. Chair one is God and me. me. Chair two is what? Me, me and God. God. What do you think chair three is? Me. Just me. Just me. So an important question, why is Rehoboam in the third chair? Why does he begin his reign in the third chair? Because his father stayed in the chair of compromise. And compromise always leads to conflict. Oh, listen to that. Listen to that, friends. Say it again, Gina. Compromise always leads to conflict. Even though his grandfather was a man after God's own heart, it was Solomon's in that had the greater influence over Rehoboam. So listen to this. Children rarely outgrow their parents spiritually. Children rarely outgrow. So if you sit here, okay, if you sit here, this in all likelihood is where your children will begin. But if you sit here, where will your children begin? Maybe here, but it will lead to here. You see this? Apart from God. Children rarely outgrow their parents spiritually. Parents, wherever you are spiritually, that's going to have a huge impact on your children's faith. And, and listen, I, we, we talked about this after last week's service. We don't say this to bash you. And I don't want you thinking, I don't, I, I don't want you dragging your way out of here, your heart crushed. Well, that, that's that. That's our children. Our children are, aren't serving the Lord, and it's our fault because we sat in this chair. And now, they're, I, listen, your children choose what chair they sit in. That's right. That's Rehoboam right. could have been a godly king. Yes. He could have surpassed his father and moved into the first chair. Right. That's a choice he would have to make. There were decisions that he would have to make in order to be in that first chair. But he could have chosen. He wasn't destined for that chair. He chose that chair. Your children choose which chair they sit in. Okay? So, so the, but the onus is on us. We need to move into the chair. We need to move into the chair of faith. And it's not too late. That's right. It is not too late. So the Bible sums up Rehoboam's legacy this way, and it's found in 2 Chronicles chapter 12, verses 13 and 14. This is such a sad, a sad a legacy here. King Rehoboam firmly established himself in Jerusalem and continued to rule. He was 41 years old when he became king, and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem. But listen to this. But he was an evil king. For he did not seek the Lord with all his heart. Rehoboam lived in the third chair of conflict. In Rehoboam's story, the conflict is obvious, right? Yes. It's external. At the beginning, it was the king versus the people. The people right? Yep. That, that, so that conflict is external, and, and, and you see it. 
but it's also represented by the constant conflict between Jeroboam and Rehoboam, the, the king of Judah and the king of Israel. So he had external conflict, but he also had internal conflict in the king. Uh, whether, again, whether his decisions were made just out of arrogance or from the crippling insecurity, both the external and the internal would drive him to make selfish choices. I believe the heart of the conflict for Rehoboam was spiritual. He had no real, ongoing, consistent, personal relationship with God. Yes, Rehoboam obeyed God in not pursuing the other ten tribes. We see that early on. But we know that he warred against Israel throughout his reign as Judah's king. And at one point, listen, when Egypt threatened Judah, see, because some of you know his story well enough to know that at one point, Egypt threatens the, the kingdom of Judah. And Rehoboam humbled himself before God. You can read about this, 2 Chronicles chapter 12. He humbles him. So that sounds like he's, he's moved from that third chair of conflict, except. Not really. Because we, we know he went to the temple, but there is no record of Rehoboam ever offering a sacrifice to the Lord. Listen to this one sentence assessment of Rehoboam found in 2 Chronicles again. We read it just a few minutes ago. He did evil. Because he what? Had not set his heart on seeking. on seeking the Lord. And the consequences were tragic for Rehoboam and for the people under his rule. It says in 1 Kings chapter, chapter uh, 14, this is what it says, listen to this. During Rehoboam's reign, the people of Judah did what was evil. The people of Judah, not just Rehoboam, but the people of Judah did what was evil in the Lord's sight, provoking his anger with their sin. For it was even worse than the sin of their ancestors. For they also built for themselves pagan shrines and sacred pillars and Asherah poles on every high hill and under every green tree. And there were even male and female shrine prostitutes throughout the land. The people imitated the practices of the pagan nations that the Lord had driven from the land ahead of the Israelites. This is chair three. And let's just let's talk about characteristics of third chair. Third chair or the conflict generation doesn't know the Lord or his works. They worship and serve the gods of the land. And they effectively become just like the pagan culture. So, you know, you may think, well, I don't have pagan gods in my house. But you know what? Whatever is first place in your heart other than God is your idol. It's your worship. So your idol may actually look just like... And you begin to center your life around that. So your idol may look just like you. Come on, if this is the chair of God and me, and this is the chair of me and God, and this is just me, ultimately your idol looks just like you. Not only that, uh, their, their prayers, their lives are marked by prayerlessness. Without prayer, there's really no other reason for being Christian. And they may only be Christian in name only, and it's only with a desire to escape hell. And they may, they may believe in the supernatural, but they very seldom, if ever, see it happening. They tend to be very superstitious about the supernatural, but not as, it, as it, the supernatural applies to God. Right. What was a must for that first generation and a convenience for the second generation becomes nonsense to the third generation. Tradition is usually what you see in the second chair. But in third chair, following rules and laws without conviction is nothing but legalism. So third chair people see no purpose in abstaining from something just because that's the way it's always been. <coughs> that's their tradition. So I, we're, you know, their mentality is if you can't find a Bible verse prohibiting it, then it must be okay to do it. And, and third People in the third chair, they're, they're schemers. Oh, I know somebody in the Bible that. Oh, Jacob. Yeah, the deceiver. Schemer. 
They scheme to cover a lack of holiness under the guise of cultural differences or individual backgrounds and personal taste. The third chair person needs a powerful encounter with God, a personal encounter with God that leads to true repentance. All right, so chair represents what? God and... God and me, the chair of <coughs> commitment. Chair number two represents me and God. The chair of compromise. Chair three is the chair of conflict, and it represents me. me. And each three of these chairs has influence and consequences for you, for your family, and for others. So it all comes down to one question. What chair do you sit in? Gina asked this question last week. What chair do you sit in? And like Pastor said a few minutes ago, here's the beauty of it. You get to choose which chair you sit in. If you had a generation before you that maybe didn't do well in representing God, you can change. You can move. If you never have had a generation before you, then you start and be that first chair generation to impact the next generation and prayerfully will impact the next generation for Christ. If you're going to remain in chair one, it's going to require God-honoring decisions. You're going to have to check with God before you make decisions. You're going to want to seek Him first. Instead of the advice of the young men, or even the advice of the old men, why not seek to find out what God wants, what His will is. As Gina said last week, you've got to make godly decisions. Just like the decision you made today to come to church. You made a decision to come to church today. Unless you're a teenager and your parents made you. Okay. <laughs> that's still good. Okay. That's still a good thing. So to keep God as your highest priority, you have to make spiritual decisions every single day. And every single day you're keeping God on the throne of your heart. So when you're making those decisions, you, take, you put God first. Even when you're in the chaos and craziness of, of Monday through Saturday... You decide, I'm going to put God first. I'm going to keep God in it. I'm going to put God in his place. Okay? And God's place is on the throne of your heart. And if you're in chair number two, the chair of compromise, like we said earlier, ask, you and God have a talk. God, where am I, where am I compromising? God, are you, not on the, are you not first in my life? And if not, show me what I've let take place of that, of you. And if you want to, well, and... If you want to move, you can move. If you want to remain, well, just keep doing what you're doing, and you'll stay, stay nice and comfortable in chair number two. But look, even that, even staying in chair number two requires choices and decisions that you make every day. Yeah. You'll just, you just keep choosing your way over God's way, right? Your time over God's timing. Your will instead of his will. And if there's anybody in the room that's in chair three, and your heart is conflicted, and your relationship with God is probably distant at, at very best. Maybe you know about him, but you aren't close to him. Maybe you feel unsettled and uncomfortable because you know you aren't where you should be. But there's good news if you're sitting in either of these chairs. The good news today is that if you don't like where you're sitting, how did you put it last week? I have one word for you. Do you know what it is, everybody? One, two, move. three. Move. Move. Okay. If you don't like where you're sitting, move. Okay, this isn't, uh, this isn't assigned seating. <laughs> okay, I, this, you, you chose where you sat out here, right? Or, or wherever you're at if you're online and you're sitting in, on, on your easy chair or whatever, your sofa, you chose where you sit. You're not super glued to any chair. Where you're sitting is not your destiny. But nothing will change if you choose to stay where you are. Nothing's going to change. So are you in a chair that's all about God? Are you in a chair that's mostly about you and God's on the back burner? Or are you in a chair that's all about you? 
Look, our, our desire for self-satisfaction, to be comfortable, to be our desire for self-satisfaction over pleasing God, that's the essence of sin. I spoke with someone this week, and he was telling me, he was telling me that, uh, that in his life, he chose, he chose to please himself rather than please God. And he understands, looking back, what he did, that decision he made. He didn't realize it in the moment. But this, this, is, this has got to be in the forefront uh, of our, our minds, friends, our heart. Because if we choose to satisfy ourselves rather than to please God, that's sin. And sin always creates distance between us and God. But here's the good news that Gina alluded to. Jesus came to make the move to the first chair possible for everyone. You know this, his once and for all sacrifice on the cross closed the gap between God and us. And it's not because we are more special than than anyone else. It's not because of anything that we can do. But it's because of what Jesus has done. That we don't have to stay in compromise. We don't have to stay in conflict. He wants us in chair one. Fully devoted to him. And Jesus makes the move to this chair possible. That's the good news. We've said this now for uh, about the last month. It's simple. It's, it is simple. Our part is simple. It, just like A, B, C. We admit, we admit the true condition of our heart. We admit our sin. And when we admit our sin to God, come on, I said it earlier. We, we quoted it earlier, 1 John 1, 9. When we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive. He forgives and he heals. We admit our sin. The second thing that we need to do is believe. We believe in the finished work of Christ on the cross and that he rose from the grave. He's not dead in a tomb, but he is risen. The, Paul says, if we believe that, this is found in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, if we believe that, then we will be saved. And then the last, the C, is to confess Jesus as your Savior. And that confession is not just at an altar. That confession is in how you live. Your life is a confession, right? Because your life should show who's in charge. So that it's not just Jesus is my Savior. Jesus is my King. And I'm going to live subject to Him. I'm going to, I want my life to honor Him. That's first chair, friends. So you probably know what chair you're sitting in. Man, I can't say it enough. If you don't like where you're sitting, now is the day. This moment is the time to make a move and come to God and say, God, I want to be a first chair on fire believer. Committed wholeheartedly to serving God. Mm-hmm.